Let's start off with a couple of questions first about life and work on orbit. Uh, Jeff, for you, it's been a busy few weeks for you and Kate and the rest of the crew uh, with visiting vehicles coming and going, a lot of research being conducted on board. Give us a sense of the choreography that uh, is being undertaken to accomplish all of this. Well, you're right. The last few weeks have been busy. Of course, we transitioned from Expedition 47 to 48. Um, and uh, Kate and Tak and Anatoly arrived uh, safely on their Soyuz to be uh, to join us on Expedition 48, and uh, they didn't have a, a whole lot of time to uh, uh, to get uh, their feet wet, you might say, on board the station, and acclimate to the environment before we had uh, supply ship showing up. First, a Progress, a Russian Progress supply ship, arrived late one night, and then a little over 24 hours later during the day, the the uh, SpaceX uh, Dragon arrived and of course uh, its arrival marked uh, the um, the start of a bunch of new work uh, we have rodent research that we had to quickly get on board and Takuya uh, was was dedicated at that getting them safely in their habitat and uh, up and running we've got some great research on board uh, the the dragon uh, you've you've heard of heart the heart cells experiment and other experiments of course there's supplies and, and equipment coming on board that we had to get offloaded and we're in the process of, of, of doing that and uh, integrating that new equipment on board station. And of course, it brings many more experiments, as well as in the external uh, compartment of Dragon, uh, it brought the, uh, the uh, IDA, or the, the new docking adapter, uh, that will accommodate the new commercial crew vehicles scheduled to fly here in, uh, in the very short future. And we'll talk about that IDA in just a moment. Jeff. Uh... You know, they say that uh, seniority can't be beat. In the cosmic sense, August 24th marks a milestone for you as you uh, will surpass Scott Kelly's short-lived record for the most amount of days in space by a U.S. astronaut, 520 days. Uh, this, your fourth flight, what does that milestone mean for you personally? And what does it say about uh, the longevity of the station and its ability to sustain a permanent human occupancy? Well, I think we would all agree that it's an honor to spend any day in space, and uh, certainly to, to have accumulated that uh, time is, is truly an honor for me. Uh, but I think you bring up the bigger point in that this program, the scope of this program of the International Space Station, I can remember when Freedom was announced in 1984, um, and having a desire to be part of it as soon as, as early as 1985, uh, and then, of course, it morphed because of, uh, largely because of geopolitical uh, situations in, in the world uh, to the International Space Station in the early 90s. And to be part of that, uh, uh, to really represent a really amazing team, especially when you look back in hindsight at what the international team accomplished, uh, to integrate what used to be MIR-2 and freedom, the elements of that, into the International Space Station, bring Russia on as a partner with the other partners, uh, that had already joined uh, Freedom uh, to integrate this new station and then to begin building it and then to permanently uh, man it uh, 15 and a half years, going on 16 years now, uh, we've had permanent human presence in space. Uh, and it's been largely very successful. We've had setbacks, we've had disappointments, we've had uh, struggles to work through, we've had uh, challenges, but the team has stepped up to that. And to, to, uh, to be a part of it at the beginning, in the middle, uh, finishing out the space station, and now um, when it's in the full utilization mode, and really stepping up uh, in terms of the greater scientific community on the world recognizing its potential and, and getting into the doorway uh, to get their uh, research on board and to see it, uh, you know, blossom in its utilization. That's really the bigger story to me personally. Kate, let's turn to you for a moment. Uh, have your first weeks in orbit been everything you expected them to be? And what has been the most stunning aspect of life in space so far for you? Yeah, I think um, nobody can really quite prepare for your first few weeks in space. And uh, it's, it's, absolutely amazing it's it's incredible um, and and I say this even working at NASA for seven years before I flew so uh, we see in mission control we see the space station on the big screen all the time it almost feels like like home like your living room it's that familiar uh, even all the cables and the wiring and the lab that you see around us but that's nothing like actually being here and uh, experiencing even these same walls that I saw all the time on television to see that 
uh, in reality and to actually get a chance to work with this, some of this equipment uh, has been absolutely incredible. And I'm a little bit split between uh, what's more fascinating to me. I look out the window and every astronaut says this, but truly the Earth is more beautiful than you can ever imagine. Uh, it's just not something that you can conceive of uh, from, from all the pictures. We're starting to do more with high definition video and I think that brings that uh, to people around the world to get a chance to see what we see. But I'm pretty split between what's more amazing to me, uh, the planet and, and actually getting to see the space station. When you look out the window, you see the equipment surrounding you uh, and you can see the entire space station from the perspective of the inside. Kate, research is the name of the game on the International Space Station. There's worldwide interest in your upcoming DNA research activities. Uh, tell us a little bit about what is coming up for you in, in regard to that research and your goals and expectations. Yeah, we've, we've had some incredible research that's arrived uh, on, the, on the Dragon vehicle. The SpaceX 9 mission has brought us uh, both topping off all of our research supplies as well as incredible new facilities. And uh, one of the things that folks are very interested in is uh, potentially doing the first DNA sequence in space. Um, that's really a testament, I think, to the ground teams that have put this together. There's folks that have worked on this project for years now, and it's not an easy thing to take a piece of Earth equipment and launch it into orbit and actually fly it on the space station. But the benefits are huge. Uh, the potential to understand the technology development of how this equipment works in microgravity. Fluids are, behave differently. Uh, bubbles move through systems differently. So we're learning a lot just from the technology development, but then it's also an application so we can understand uh, a, a whole number of variables that change in response to either microgravity or the radiation environment in low Earth orbit. And we can actually understand that at a real global level and start to look at not just one or two gene, but 10,000s of genes, 30,000 genes, and get all of that data all at once. As far as worldwide interest is concerned, no shortage of that when it comes to your upcoming spacewalk to install that first international docking adapter uh, to the forward end of the U.S. segment of the station. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, first off, the extraction process, uh, how the IDA will be pre-positioned to set the stage for your excursion outside. That highlights one of the capabilities that has been developed over the years, and that is uh, how we do robotic arm operations. In the beginning, the crew on board did virtually all of the operations, with the exception of maybe just setting the, up arm, uh, setting the arm up, getting it operational, and then uh, putting it away, so to speak. Uh, but over the years, the, the ground has developed more and more capability, and now they do 90-some 90, 90 percent of the robotic arm operations from the ground. And that includes the extraction of this IDA from the um, external bay in the, in the Dragon cargo vehicle. So they will pluck it out of the bay and they will put it uh, at the very front end of the space station on um, the pressurized mating adapter where the shuttle used to dock um, and, and approach that PMA um, and be just uh, very close to it when we go out the door. And, and as we go out the door, they'll bring it in to within a couple of inches of its mating interface, and then we'll go out there and do the final attachment uh, of the, the, um, the docking adapter, and then of course they'll ungrapple and move it away. So that'll be the big picture of the choreography to get it out there in place, and then of course we'll finish out the installation of uh, cables, power and data cables and whatnot uh, on the, uh, the IDA itself during the course of the spacewalk. And in that regard, for both of you, uh, if you could give me uh a bit of a detailed rundown on what tasks each of you will be responsible for, how you work in tandem, how you work apart from one another uh, to get the IDA actually physically mated uh, to that pressurized mating adapter at the forward end of Harmony. Yeah, it's actually, um, uh, we've got the Olympics coming up here and it's actually a little bit like a, uh, a synchronized swimming operation. So we're gonna work in tandem with the ground teams and Jeff and I will be going out. We're gonna be uh, on clock positions at the, at the IDA. So it's actually quite a huge uh, piece of equipment when you see it up close. Um, it, you know, it's, it's meters in diameter. And so we'll be holding it uh, from either end of the clock position and the robotic arm's gonna bring it in towards us. 
we'll continue to bring it in station, and then ground teams are going to do some complicated operations to drive the hooks. Uh, that's going to be controlled uh, from our internal crew member, uh, Takuya Onishi, will be, will be working that, and uh, ground teams will then do some operations to bring that adapter all the way into station and establish that, uh, that mating compartment, that docking adapter, for future commercial crew vehicles. Kate, uh, if uh, we can get the mic back to you for a second, this will be your first spacewalk, uh, always a prime milestone for any astronaut. Uh, what are your thoughts and expectations? What are you looking forward to the most as you step outside and become a satellite in space? Well, uh, quite frankly, I'm not sure how the view can get any better than it is from the cupola already. So I don't know that I have any expectations beyond I can't even uh, conceive of what this is going to be like. Uh, in terms of the actual work, we train for hundreds of hours, and uh, there's a huge amount of effort on the ground that goes into this. We have teams uh, in our neutral buoyancy lab that help train us. Uh, they weigh us out, so we have all six degrees of freedom, and we can learn how to use the tools and all the operations. There's an entire EVA team on the ground that's helped us get ready for this spacewalk and, and has done the training for both of us for a number of years. And of course, Jeff has experienced at this, um, but I think I'm just going to rely on the training and the, uh, the experience that I have on the ground and the preparation that those ground teams have given me. And uh, definitely, we're going to be working hard, but I will try to take a few moments to enjoy it and get a few pictures of uh, this beautiful new hardware that we're adding to the front of space station. And Jeff, for you, this will be your fourth spacewalk spanning 16 years in both U.S. and Russian spacesuits. What sense of history do you have? You're the history buff on board. What sense of history uh, do you have in yet another milestone being added to the chapter of the International Space Station? Oh, my goodness. Well, in the context of doing a spacewalk, of course, spacewalks uh, are a big part of the history of the ISS, made it possible. We've, uh, uh, in the program, I think, to date, have accomplished, uh, going on 200, 180 some or 190, maybe uh, now more spacewalks in the construction and maintenance of the space station. And as you mentioned, in both U.S. and Russian suits, uh, and participants from all of the partners have, have been in the core of the cadre of astronauts and cosmonauts that have conducted that. So that's a big part of the history. In terms of the, the IDA, the docking adapter, that opens the door to commercial crew vehicles. Um, and th that is the next major chapter on the horizon being developed in the plan um, uh, to fly. Uh, and of course, we don't know what that's going to open up in the future, but it is a significant door opening up in the, human, uh, uh, in the history of human space exploration. That in the context of the ISS, which again is the, the most significant technological achievement, in my opinion, in history. When you consider the complexity of this thing, how long it's been flying, uh, the international scope of it, the technological scope of it, uh, and then the fact that we sustain it uh, logistically and operationally for so long. And the partnership itself, among all the partners, has never been better, in my opinion. In my experience in the, across the entire program, it's never been better than it is right now. So even from a, an international relations point of view, I trust that it serves as a, a very positive example to the world below. A new era in human spaceflight about to dawn on the International Space Station through your spacewalk. We'll be watching and uh, looking forward to every minute of it. For Jeff and Kate, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. All the best as your colleague floats through and uh, fly safe. Thank you very much, Rob. Great talking to you today. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the JSCPAO interview. Thank you. Thank you, JSCPAO. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure video and audio communications.